we'll get back to some Australian matters and sport. What sort of year has it been for Australian sport this year? Uh, it started rather disastrously, didn't it, but with Djokovic not being able to play in the Australian Open. Um, they couldn't qualify for the finals of the T20 World Cup, even though it was played in Australia. Uh, they won a pile of gold medals at the Commonwealth Games, as they always do. Um, and they... Uh, what else have happened? Well, Ash Barty won, I think, the Australian Open, or was it Wimbledon? She won a Grand Slam and then promptly retired. Um, it seems like they've had uh, more things going wrong rather than right. And then there's this whole business with the cricketers at the moment, which is about to be revisited, and it could have some really serious implications anyway. Joining us now is my old mate, Steve Rebillion, Australian radio and television commentator, a very familiar voice and face to us in New Zealand, uh, the voice of the gymnastics at the Olympic and Commonwealth Games. He was in Birmingham this year, and I think he thoroughly enjoyed himself there. Steve, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, can we start right back at the beginning? wasn't a particularly good way for the Australian sporting year to begin uh, with that banning of Djokovic. It was a big story worldwide. It wasn't just a sports story. Looking back now, what effect did it have not having the number one player in the world able to play in the Australian Open? I look, because Ash Barty won the women's event, I, I think the attention on Djokovic sort of faded. But for a while there, it was like news around the world, what the, how the Australian government was reacting to uh, uh, Djokovic's refusal to be vaccinated. Now, that sort of divided the community too, you know, into pro and pro-choice on these matters or whether he actually had to have one to come here. And um, look, it was a bit blurry and badly handled, but in the end, people's attention was shifted from Djokovic to, to the local girl made good, who then promptly retired, yeah. of course, mm. at the ripe old age of 25, which is... It seemed astonishing at the time until she explained, well, look, I just had enough, you know, and, and I can understand that. If you watch closely the lifestyle of these um, touring tennis players, it's really not that much fun. And she'd achieved what she wanted to do. So Ash Barty said, that'll do at 25. And I, I, th- I really do think she's done with it. She's got married and would rather spend some time at home and play golf. Like she, she plays off about four, as you probably know. <laughs> and there's no suggestion that she might make a comeback? Well, I think she's determined not to. And I, I was put in mind of um, Mark Eller. You know, if you go back to 1984, successful Grand Slam tour of the UK, and he retired at 25, the best fly half in the world at the time. I said, why is he doing that? Well, he'd had enough and he mm. wanted to do something else. And I think we have to respect that decision of athletes, even though we can feel they've got more in them. But their time has come. If they don't like the lifestyle, if they're not enjoying it anymore, well, you're silly to keep going, aren't you? And there's a parallel, actually, with Lydia Ko and Ash Barty. Lydia Ko is 25, and she's been talking about retirement. She said some years ago, when she was still a teenager, and she'd started to make a name, I think she might have even been the number one golfer in the world at the time, at about 18 years of age, uh, that she came out and said that she wants to be retired by the time she's 30. And she's been mm. questioned a couple of times of late because she's now back as the number one ranked golfer in the world and it doesn't appear that she's of a mind to want to change her opinion. I mean, you'd think at 25 she could have a very successful golfing career for 20 years. She's getting married, I think, in a couple of weeks so that might well right. prompt her um, to think seriously about retiring even before she's at the age of 30. But yeah, you can see money, I suppose, in the case of Ash Barty as well. She probably doesn't need to work again for the rest of her life, does she? No, she doesn't. She's, she made um, a ridiculous amount of money in, in the last couple of years. And she, she won the French. She won Wimbledon and it admitted to Pat Rafter before Wimbledon, so, uh, just after Wimbledon, said, so, oh, look, I'm thinking about retiring. She went on to the Australian Open, won it, and then that, that was it. But, you know, Lydia Ko, you mentioned, I remember I interviewed her when she was 14 after she finished runner-up in the New South Wales Open. Still an amateur then, of course. And I said, oh, what are you doing next? She said, oh, I'm going back to uh, going back to school for a while. I said, oh, how do you feel about that? She said, great, because I'd have to play golf. And that was when she was <laughs> 14. 14. So they, they, of yeah. course, they burn out, you see, Telf. It, it's so much yeah. and, and so... So intense. Well, in, in, well, in her case, she first came to national prominence in New Zealand at the age of seven when she was comp- right. competing in uh, a national championship at a golf club in Auckland. And I was on the air in radio sport, and Peter Williams, who, who you know, a colleague of mine, rang me and said, mm. said me, Telf, have you heard about the, seven, the seven-year-old the seven girl playing in the national uh, amateur championships at Tudorangi? I said, what, seven? Mm. And he said, it's causing quite a kerfuffle. She's got no idea of golf etiquette. She's wandering across mm. the 
green when her uh, competitors are putting and she's playing with the flag stick and uh, other golfers uh, complain, <laughs> complaining about her. <laughs> and so they had a meeting and appointed a chaperone as well as a caddy uh, for the rest of the tournament. But so, yes, at seven she was in that white-hot heat of battle, you know, somewhere near the top of the sport in New Zealand. So pro- probably by the time she gets to 30, she would have well and truly had enough. Anyway, back to the Australian sporting year. I suppose the Commonwealth well, Games would have to loom large because, I mean, you always win. How many gold medals did you win this year? Close, was it? Oh, I think it was 67. They topped the medal count by 10. They beat the UK, uh, beat um, beat England by 10. But And I suppose there are a couple of standout performances there. And uh, You would have liked seeing Ollie Hall win the 1500 on the track. I mean, we don't win many of those kinds of medals. But I was more interested, as someone who was there and sort of up to my neck in it, and it was my eighth Commonwealth Games, so without question, it was the best one I've been to. It was best organised, best supported, and the people of Birmingham were so proud and, and happy to have the, the world's eyes, or at least the Commonwealth's eyes, on, on that city. Um, it just made it a joy to be there, and it really breathed, for me, it breathed life back into the Commonwealth Games, because uh, it certainly took a knock in 2010 in Delhi, where the Games did not go well, and uh, I, I just felt Birmingham did a stunning job. The, the security was was tight but friendly. Um, the people were very welcoming. Um, you know, the, had so many um, smaller countries get the opportunity that they don't have at the Olympics uh, to actually shine and even to participate because the big countries don't just boss the medal count, they also boss the entry list. It's hard for smaller countries to even get a start, let alone win a medal. And that's not the case at the Commonwealth Games. I, I really like the atmosphere and I, um, it's a bit bold. Australia's move to host it around regional Victoria next time around. I hope it comes off because I think... You know, we've made some really positive steps to uh, with the Commonwealth Games uh, being in Birmingham. So it was a great experience. But there is an issue here, isn't there? I mean, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, Boris Johnson, when he was the Prime Minister of Britain three or four years ago, uh, kicked in uh, uh, over a billion d- dollars in our money, or it might have been a billion pound, after Durban fell over and the Commonwealth Games Federation was in a, a really tight spot about whether they could find anyone for these games. And so uh, that's the kind of money that you need now isn't it? You're talking billions of dollars to stage the Commonwealth Games, which I think excludes most of the countries from the Commonwealth, though, doesn't it? I think I think that's fair enough comment. Um, but Birmingham managed to only have to build one or two venues. They used existing venues or updated them. Uh, they were pretty smart and managed it financially very well. Um, but I think that's fair comment. It feels at the moment as though only the UK and Australia has the appetite to host it. Canada seems to have lost a little bit of interest, which is which is a shame. But even if it just tick tocks between, you know, Great Britain and Australia, then uh, and they and they manage to keep it going. My experience in Birmingham tells me it's still worth doing. Mm. Um, that, yeah, for sure, the, it, it is. There, there was less of a, there's less of a fear of failure amongst the athletes. I just want to make that point. So the athletes, I think, enjoy it more. The intensity of the Olympics is so unforgiving that um, just to go and participate and it really did feel like a family of nations this Commonwealth, I think it still mm. feels that way mm, it, it is, yeah mm. Mm. it does, they will always be known as, as the friendly games for, for that reason well Auckland also has been making noises over the last year or so about uh, hosting the Commonwealth Games now I remember in 1990 when the games were in Auckland, a, a good friend of mine and you probably remember him as well, the late John Davies was on the board, the Commonwealth Games board and he told me that the budget for the 1990 Commonwealth Games this is for capital expenditure and all of the other costs involved topped a hundred million dollars and we were all kind of just aghast a hundred million dollars for a 10-day sporting event now a hundred million dollars would get you nothing for the Commonwealth Games so if they come back to Auckland uh, someone here uh, in this city or the central government and probably the ratepayers of Auckland includes people like me uh, are going to have to fork out and so there isn't a great deal of enthusiasm, I think, on the ground. Local politicians and uh, others uh, from sporting events are interested in it, but um, I have my doubts if they'll uh, come back here anytime soon. OK, let's move on. What sort of year have you had in cricket? I know you're doing pretty well against the West Indies at the moment, but <laughs> overall? Uh, yeah, it's, I think the cricket calendar is so crowded that uh, uh, some uh, cricket followers are a little confused and disillusioned with with um, 
you know, the importance of, of games. Like, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell where where to, to turn your eyes. I, 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 it's certainly been overshadowed this week by the, by the David Warner ball tampering um, leadership uh, fracker argument. Um, look, I, I thought the, the Australians played very well in the last uh, few days in Adelaide and there have been a few standout performances, but it's been the case for some years that the West Indies don't have a great appetite for test cricket. They're all interested in the shorter form of the game. But... Um, Oh, look, the, the Australian team is still good. We'll get a better measure when we take on South Africa in the next mm. few weeks here. Um, but here, here's the, the David Water here, saga is, is very interesting. It's yes, exactly. Hard is to it get right to the bottom of? Yeah. Has there been any more revelations from the letter or the comments made by Warner's manager? I think I'm right in saying that he his yeah. alleg- his allegations were that there could have been high ranking officials involved in encouraging the players to ball tamper. Have I got that right? That's right. Yeah. Well, James Erskine, David Warner's manager, says that Australian cricket management actively encouraged the team to tamper with the ball in Hobart 2016 against South Africa. So that's well before the incident at Newlands. And my feeling at the time, Telp, when this all came out uh, with Warner, Bancroft and Smith uh, against South Africa, in South Africa, was that the reaction was, was an overreaction in terms of the punishment for these players. Because it's, it's well documented that this had been going on for years. English, Pakistani, South African players had all been caught doing it and it got no more than a slap on the wrist. And in a, in a show perhaps similar to yours, I, I watched it's more a televised radio show, if you like. Freddie Flintoff was sitting there saying, what is the big deal here? We all do it. We sit down in the dressing room before a test match and discuss who's going to do it. Now, the Australians stupidly and naively took it to a whole another level with sandpaper, but it's basically the same yeah, thing. Yeah. And, and the, the reaction to ban guys for years and to ban David Warner from any leadership role for a lifetime just seemed to me and to a lot of Australians like an overreaction. And now the ban could be overturned. Cricket Australia has now um, got itself in, in a, a tied itself in a knot because they said they can't overturn it. Well, it turns out they probably can and if they want to. Um, so it's just whether they want to. Mm. I mean, David Warner's not a fairly polarising player. He's not everybody's favourite. But I, I think that the punishment for him and for Smith at the time, just personally, I thought it was an overreaction. Yes, yeah, certainly the, the lifetime leadership ban. I mean, also, it's a double kind of uh, jeopardy imposed here, isn't it? Because he was banned, first of all, for supposedly uh, ball tampering. Then they whacked another uh, penalty on top of it. Normally, in a civil law, they the, the punishments run concurrently. But anyway or the sentences run concurrently. Here's a question for you. Um, The BBL, the Big Bash League, is an immensely popular form of the game in Australia. This is the the T20 competition, which attracts many of the world's leading players there. There's big money. And so you'd think the Australians, if nothing else, would be the world champions, uh, along with maybe India, uh, who have, have of course, the IPL. You'd think these two countries would be the the two best T20 countries in the world. You hosted the T20 World Cup this year and you couldn't even Mm. make the playoffs, thanks, I think, largely to what happened in that match against New Zealand, first up, where you got thumped and you never really recovered from that, did you? No, no, the, <laughs> you knocked us around in that one. The, the, the post-mortems were, were uh, coming thick and fast after our um, exit from the tournament a bit early. But, uh, because they don't, they'd won the thing uh, only uh, shortly beforehand, like a year or two ago, whenever it was. But that what, they, what we feel happened was that they stuck with some players who had probably lost form but had won them the cup previously. I thought, well, these guys must be able to, to perform again. And, and a few of them were out of form. I mean, Finch included, uh, Aaron Finch and I don't know, a couple of others, and they, they probably should have moved on with some new selections. But, yes, you're right. They, they just got hammered in that, um, in that first match against the Kiwis and their... Um, their run rate the run suffered. Mm, mm. Run rate, yeah, suffered uh, accordingly, and they they never quite recovered. So uh, that's, you only have to switch off once in a short format like that, and um, that, that's what can happen. So when is I presume the next Ashes series will be? Uh, is, there's not one this summer, is it? It's too late. Uh, uh, England would have to be in Australia by now. So is it next year in mm. England? Is it the next Ashes series? 
Oh gosh, you caught, uh, caught me out there, too. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, okay. Saying, uh, I'm just yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. it's going to be interesting, isn't it? The next time Australia plays England with this new baz ball uh, that <laughs> English <laughs> English cricket is playing, um, and it, yeah. it is extraordinary what's happening with with the English this English Test side. I mean, I heard last ah, night. Yeah. I, heard, I was watching it last night, and the, one of the commentators said that the r- average run rate for England in this test series and now it's getting to the fourth day today of the second test mm. so England have had basically four innings and their run rate from those four innings is 5.91 runs per over that's that's a very good that's a very good run rate in a 50 over match <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah well you know I, I i admire them i think i think that that first test um against Pakistan, people are saying it's one of the best test matches ever played. And you, and you need both sides to come to the party, I suppose, in their attitude to the game. And it's just, it's refreshing to see. And, um, well, yeah, I'm, we're all, all power to New Zealand cricket for, <laughs> for influencing it, the outcome <laughs> yeah. that way. It's bad. Yeah. OK, uh, let's talk some rugby. I don't know whether you have seen the story this morning. I read it somewhere online. Uh, that apparently over the weekend, Eddie Jones had a conversation with the boss of Australian rugby. Read into that what you will, Steve. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Eddie's a, he's an interesting character, isn't he? I, 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 with such a good win-loss record with England, it's kind of surprising that they punted him so close to a World Cup next year. But it seems the case with Eddie and some other coaches that they have a lifespan, you know. That they, they, they lose the dressing room at some point, and he's a very intense character, as as you guys know. Um, uh, what was that saga with John Mitchell and Eddie not wanting him to go and watch his son play cricket, uh, uh, if I recall that correctly? Well, mm, well you know, mm. it's, that, that 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 that's okay for a while, as long as you're winning and the players buy into it a hundred percent. But it seems that Eddie wears people out, and uh, that. That record is known here, so I don't know how he'll go re-establishing himself here. But um, yeah, but the, the, Australia's problems with rugby run a lot deeper than who happens to be the national coach at the time. It's a, it's the particip- participation rate and the, and the falling numbers and the falling interest because of the way the game is played, and and you hold it up against something like the interest generated by the soccerers at the World Cup mm. Um, mm. this last few weeks and uh, that was massive you know i live opposite a uh, a park in the northern suburbs of sydney and uh, the morning that we were playing argentina they decided to put a big screen up in the park and there were hundreds of people just gathering to watch see how the soccer is went against argentina well it was you know it was almost certain they were going to lose but people are very interested mm. in football in this country now they, the, the kid, kids are not, are not playing rugby they're, they're turning to soccer and other sports yeah. yes I, I was thinking of that actually when I saw some uh, some footage on the news bulletin here or bulletins here that, that night of from uh, fan uh, setups around Sydney and other parts of Australia and hundreds probably thousands of frenetic Australians I thought they were Brazilians yeah. or Argentinians the way they were going off their head and I'm thinking this is this is not a good look for 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 rugby is it trying to get out there and recruit young kids playing rugby uh, when mm. soccer in fact I suppose it would be close to the highlight of the sporting year wouldn't it for Australia to to, to have got to the second round of the last 16 at the Football World Cup Oh, yeah. And this is a genuine world sport, isn't it? It's no, the sure. most played yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah. And um, to, to make the last 16, like we, we overachieved, seriously. We, we got there having beaten Peru in a penalty shootout. Um, but then, you know, Graham Arnold, first Australian uh, coach to take the Socceroos to that level of the World Cup. They won two games back to back, which we hadn't done before. We scored in every game. We ran into, you know, uh, an Argentinian inside that that deserve to win that match, but we, we went pretty close to drawing it. And it's just lovely to see this almost United Nations of a team that we have. They come from everywhere. There's a young striker, Garen Qual, from Sudan, and Harry Smith wow, from that, Scotland. That, they, that's they, the guy they that, could not be more... Was yeah, it the guy that scored the goal? Scored them. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, 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 Qual didn't score, but he nearly did it at the death against Argentina. And he's only 18. He, he got limited minutes. But um, it's a really interesting team. And, and it emphasises that this sport is, is for all body types. You know, Harry Suter is this six foot four inch Scotsman, and, and uh, young Qual's only, you know, five foot nine and probably 60 kilos dripping wet. But, you, you know, it, it's a great sport for all people. And, and in Australia, women's football in particular is, remains one of the fastest growing sports here it's just uh, it's it's sucking players away from from other uh, team sports mm. 
Well, there's a few other things we could look at as well, Steve, but uh, netball, another successful season, a rugby league, another successful season, winning a world crown. These are fairly predictable, but uh, overall, fascinating and interesting year for Australian sport, as it always is. Steve, I thank you very much indeed for your time, and I hope you have a very happy and enjoyable Christmas, and uh, hopefully we might be able to get together and hit a few golf balls next year, now that we can travel again. Yeah, we'll get you over on this side of the ditch and you can take my money again. That'll be good. Okay, Steve. Thanks for your time. Much appreciated. Pleasure.